I think before the before the famine, uh, you know, uh, uh, this year and the, and the and the drought and grabbing headlines and Angelina Jolie and all these celebrities talking about it, I think mo for most Americans, Somalia sort of evoked one image, and that was a Black Hawk Down, you know, the infamous shoot down of a U.S. helicopter in 1993 that ultimately led to the withdrawal of, of about 20,000 U.S. so-called peacekeepers from Somalia. Uh, when 9/11 happened, the Bush administration. Uh, actually had Somalia on a list of countries that it wanted to intervene in directly. There was a sort of ragtag group of Islamist uh, militants there, and, and the uh, Bush administration was concerned that they were going to give refuge to al-Qaeda members fleeing Afghanistan when the, when the U.S. went in there. But ultimately, uh, the Bush administration decided not to go into Somalia right away. And instead, what it did was to um, begin waging a, a proxy war using a network of ruthless warlords. And, and the, the, this network of warlords that were supported by the CIA and U.S. Special Operations Forces after 9-11 had a name that just reeked of, uh, of CIA involvement. It was called the Alliance um, for counterterrorism and the restoration of peace, um, and uh, and and so these these warlords were essentially tasked with hunting down individuals that Washington had determined uh, were Al Qaeda militants or were supporting Al Qaeda. The end result, though, of this program was that the these militia leaders, these warlords backed by the CIA. Uh, operated as an effective death squad, believing they had the full support of the CIA. The CIA funded them and, uh, and gave them lists of people to go after. And so they started hunting down anyone that they could accuse of being or did accuse of being an Islamic radical. But many of the people that were killed by these CIA-funded warlords had nothing to do with al-Qaeda and nothing to do with any form of terrorism. They were prayer leaders, they were uh, principals at madrasas, uh, religious schools in Somalia, or they were just people that had clan rivalry with the CIA warlords. So, I mean, it's a classic tale that's played out through U.S. history. So these warlords were tasked with hunting down what really amounted to about a dozen people in the, uh, in the, were in the uh, estimation of true Somalia experts, former U.S. diplomats that had worked on the country, um, and they turned it into the, these sort of killing fields. What happened as a result of that is that regionally throughout Somalia, uh, these Islamic courts started rising up. And they literally were that. They were Islamic courts. They were a form of justice um, because it was lawless in Somalia. The last time there was a stable government there was 1991. Um, and so these Islamic courts were sort of indigenous movements of religious leaders that were helping to mediate land disputes or I implementing some form of a criminal code. And many people, you know, while, while they were the, these courts were you know, very pronounced Sharia court practitioners um, brought some semblance, semblance of stability to the various regions where they established these courts. Well, the CIA and the U.S. military uh, began to grow concerned that Somalia was becoming, uh, you know, a pronounced Islamic republic. And so the warlords, backed by the CIA, intensified their campaign against these Islamic courts. The courts, in turn, got tremendous support from local business people, from clan leaders and others. People were fed up with the warlords, the CIA-backed warlords. So these, these little autonomous courts formed an Islamic courts union. And very swiftly, with the support of the vast majority of, of Somalis across the country, overthrew the CIA warlords and expelled them from Mogadishu and brought stability to Somalia, to the Somali capital, for the first time since the government of Siad Bari fell in 1991. It was a tremendous achievement. The vast majority of the people involved with these courts were not Islamic radicals, were not supporting al-Qaeda. There were 12 courts. They largely represented Somalia's clan-based system of government governance and decision-making. There was a 13th entity within the Islamic Courts Union known as al-Shabaab. They were tolerated by people within the courts. They were viewed as sort of radical outside of the mainstream of, of Somali society. There's not an Islamic, a historic uh, s Islamic radical tradition in Somalia. And this small group was the group that Osama bin Laden and others exploited. And they started sending in small groups of uh, foreign al-Qaeda operatives to embed within Shabab. But Shabab was kept in check by the other members of these Islamic courts, and they were a, a, a ragtag militant group of relative nobodies uh, within Somalia. In 2006, then, General John Abizade, the head of U.S. Central Command, gives the green light to the Ethiopian military. Ethiopia and Somalia's sworn enemies have fought multiple wars to invade Somalia, 30, 40,000 troops, backed by U.S. air power, the CIA, and the Joint Special Operations Command. They go in and they overthrow the Islamic Courts Union, the only government that was able to bring any stability to Mogadishu in a long, long time. Um, and they start killing the leaders and forcing them on the run. And, uh, and rendering them to Djibouti, where the U.S. has a, a, a major base. Um, and Somalia then turns into, once again, a, a state of utter chaos. Um, 
within the context of the U.S. dismantling the ICU, you have al-Shabaab, this relatively non-powerful entity, become the vanguard of the fight against the United States and the Ethiopians, who everyone viewed as a proxy for Washington. So they took this group of nobodies, who were the smallest player within this revolution within Somalia, and turned them into the premier vanguard. And al-Shabaab uh, very swiftly started to capture territory throughout rural Somalia and to wage a very successful, violent insurgency against the U.S.-backed transitional federal government. And that has been the state of affairs since 2007. Shabab control far more territory in Somalia than the U.S.-backed government. And so you can say that Shabab would not have existed in its current form had the United States not backed those warlords, had they not overthrown the only real indigenous, popular group of people to govern Mogadishu, this would not be happening. The bombings that we're seeing today would not be happening. Um, Shabab would not be in control of as much territory in the country as they are. Hmm.